Any obsessions with your... Yeah, sorry. So, please, uh, guys, could you help us? Could you help us to start a new yeah, session, yeah, please? Yeah, yeah, sorry, but we have to. We want to be late. So thank you for helping us. Thank you. Do you love? Fish fall down. Good luck, huh? See you. Quem que é o rapporteur? Oh, quem vai ser o rapporteur? É, Natália, quem vai ser o rapporteur? Ah, mudou tudo. Não, e ela? O que, que é isso? Técnica. Ah. Ah. É o Diagno e Laertes. O Diógenes é do Ius Group, é isso? Eu preciso sair exatamente de vocês virem, porque senão... Sim, senhora, sim, senhora, sim, senhora, hein? Vem cá, vem cá, vem cá, Natália. Clara, vem cá. É, ela é o que que é? Host do, da sala, é isso? Ela é, não, mas não sei mas se é o nome dela, não. Não ah, o nome dela, não. Eu quero citar todo mundo, deixa, vai. Eu não sei o nome dela. Eu sei o nome dela. Ela é host. Mas ela é aqui da turma aqui, hein? Ela é staff. Eu sei. Ela. Do staff aqui? É. Gente, eu sei, você vai sair na hora que você vai precisar, às 10 e 20. Agora. Eu tenho mais falando? Estou brincando. Ah, isso não. Já fiquei. Você vai falar aqui, ó. Penúltimo, pode ser? Ah, ótimo. Ah. Não sei se não vou ficar sem o meu cartão. Não sei se você, você falou agora? Eu moderei o meu agora. Agora, é. você sabe. É. Eu queria dar um tempo. Ah, não é da outra pessoa que você tirou o carinho, não sei o quê? Não tem também outra rola. Tem, a gente tem só coisas que a gente não tem que agora. Ai, sai de perto. Sai, 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 sai. Eu, tô, eu tô falando da bad vibe. Sai de perto, pelo amor de Deus. Vamos começar oh. falando da bad vibe. Não, não, tem que colocar todo mundo online.
Hello? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon or good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, this workshop aims to identify the opportunities and challenges of virtual reality for the connected society. Since it will change the way we publish and consume data, socialize and learn and do science in business. Uh, we explain more detail in the schedule. If you go there, you can see more detail about this workshop in our aims. The fact is virtual reality is not a buzzword. It's been around since the 60s, but today we have a better technologies, faster processors, chip, chips, bandwidth, and enriched, in, enriched web. Technical communities want to leverage virtual reality a step forward and make it the next computing platform. Web has been essentially the same since its invention, but now virtual reality has potential to eliminating the constraints we always have when using a flat screen like this notebook or a web browser. That is what this workshop is about, virtual reality in the web. Well, before introducing the speakers, I want to express my gratitude to all the team that make all their best to make this workshop happen. Uh, first of all, Mr. Diogo Cortes, who uh, is the, was the coordinator of this workshop, and the co-coordinator, Mrs. 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 Caroline Burley, uh, also my organization, Nick BR, and I want to thanks to Mr. Hartmut Glaser to make it available, and also the co-organizer, Mr. Daniel Gatt from Pontifical Catholic University who, who helped to make it available. I want to thanks to the rapporteur here, Mr. Georgios Laercius, very Greek, this name, or Roman, whatever, and the, our uh, Natalia, uh, uh, okay, she's, she's here, thank you very much. And also our host, Virginia Savisca, thank you very much. Um, and introducing the speakers, Diogo Cortes, she, uh, he is a researcher at Wab Technology Study Center at NICBR. Uh, he researches in emerging technologies, especially virtual reality and blockchain. You have the floor, please. Hello. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Okay, thank you, Wagner. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I want to start my talk uh, saying that VR is not a buzzword. Actually, uh, in fact, it's a research area that has been around since the 60s. One of the first VR projects was the Sensorama, if you see the timeline here. Uh, a project designed by Morton Helling to display stero stereoscopic 3D images in a wide angle view, providing bo body tilting, stereo sounds, winds, and aroma during the film. So it was like the first uh, machine to create a immersive media. So it was in 60. Then in 65, Ivor Sanderland, that I think that he is known as the father of computer graphic, uh, create the ultimate display, a prototype of glasses that projected displays object to the user eyes. It was the first head-mounted display that we have seen now in a commercial version. Uh, since then, since then uh, virtual reality has become the subject of research not only in the fields of computer science and engineering, but also in psychology, 
communication and media studies. An example of this movement that I bring here is like the book Hamlet on the Holodeck, published in 97 by Janet Murray, a researcher at that, that time at Harvard who inaugurated a movement of studies of how storytelling would be in a immersive media. And the technology has gone through development process and improvements that have brought us to the current level where we are able to build eff effective applications of virtual reality. Nowadays, we have the required technologies and graphic process chips, so thank you to the GPUs, the graphic process units, that push it forward, not just the VR, but, but also the artificial intelligence. So if you're seeing like a, a, a great moving in our AI, it's because GPUs also, and, out, and of course in the VR. So now we have like a computer graphic processing that has the power to provide us the technology that we need to build great virtual reality projects. And a milestone in the contemporary period of story of virtual reality was the launch of the Oculus Rift. That's the last one in the timeline. The project that started in the Kickstarter and we showed to the large industry that at that time there was already the technology needed to create, create effective virtual reality projects. So and now it's possible to identify a major movement of technical communities to leverage virtual reality forward and make it the next computing platform. Web has been essentially the same as Wagner mentioned. So it would be like one of the environment that will be impact in the next years. We'll have a speaker, Dominique from W3C that will explain a little bit about it. Sorry, uh, and now we are seeing like leading company, le leading technologies companies identify this trend, and they are focused on developing their products and services in these areas. Just uh, a map to show this: Facebook has bought Oculus, Google has the project Cardboard and the Dream, and also Tango, the project for augmented reality, and Microsoft has the Hololens and also HC together create the Vive. And all the universities and technical communities are straightening their works and research in this area. Scientists, engineers, designers, and programmers are being allocated in the large number to work specifically in this area. The generation of knowledge and the process of innovation on the subject is only growing. This m movement drives even more the development of technology of virtual reality. To get a sense of the market, this is a, a report from Goldman Sachs that points out that virtual reality investment, so the investment in virtual reality, have already reached $3.5 billion last year. And they project that by 2025, uh, uh, the market will be $80 billion. It's the same size of the desktop PC market today. So it's the, what they are projecting. So virtual reality is becoming strategic for many technology companies. The possibilities of interaction that these technologies bring, bring us are so promising that experts already call it the next computing platform. The most well-known use of virtual reality Reality is, of course, games and entertainment. But now we are seeing a lot of projects in many areas, especially in education, research, etc. Just to show some projects uh, in different areas, this is a project for Cancer Research UK, the institute, that is investing 20 million pounds just to uh, virtual reality research in tumors. So it will be the first time that the technology has been used to virtually build and study real life tumors. Why it? Because it will give us a new approach to 
study and deal with the data. So it's very different, like if I have a table, it, we see the data in a, in a way. But if you have a graphic, you see in another way. And with 3D, using immersive technologies, it has an improvement in our, in our perception and how we deal with data. Okay. Your time is almost over. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, we also have this project like for uh, education, that's a project from Google called Expeditions that create immersive content for kids around the world. We also have uh, performed a project for education that we use uh, to build like teachers and students all around the world in the same place, even if they are geographically separated, they can come together in a virtual space and they can play with the data, they can share knowledge in a new manner. Of course, we have like Moodle, we have like, um, we have like Blackboard, that are like tools for online research. But during our research, we found that students using this platform, they feel they do not want to participate because they feel like uh, lack of community because they are not together. They are only typing in forums. They only changing information in chats. So we move forward and we create an experiment to use this. And it, br it brought a new way to interact in a virtual world. And it's very, very important for uh, flipped classroom. That's an educational approach that has been taken in many countries around the world. And we have a uh, uh, paper published in IAAA, Human Systems Interaction, this year, that shows these results. So if you are interested in this place, you can move around. So One minute. One minute. Could you please move? So now we are seeing that the market is leading us to this movement since we move from computers to smartphones, then the next big platform for us uh, will be uh, the head-mounted display in virtual reality. But I, we can move on, we can move on. And, but it's bring us some kinds of new ways to, to deal socially, interaction also, and, be, and bring us new challenges. I think that in EGF we talk a lot about data privacy, but now using virtual reality we need to tell about privacy in our human senses. Because the user will be immersed in, in an environment that was developed by a third party. It could be a big industry, could be a small industry. But, and it has a lot of implications in, our, in how we perceive the world and in our perception. I would like to share a lot of studies, but we don't have time, so we can move forward because the other speakers will tell more about the impact and challenges of virtual reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cortes, for your <coughs> introduction. So now we, remove, we move to Dominique Hazel Massier. Uh, he is our uh, remotely invited speaker. He is a W3C Developer Relationships Lead, uh, and he is part of the W3C Project Management Team, W3C Strategy Specialist on Virtual and Augmented Reality. Uh, you can speak now, if you can hear us. Yes. Okay, Dominique, go ahead.
Hello, Dominique. Can you hear us?
Okay, thank you, Dominique, for uh, your presentation. Thank you for telling us uh, about the web as a platform to unify all platforms. And also thank you for telling us about web VR and web XR technologies. And please stay with us for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, now I would like to move on and please, uh, I want to present Sharit Fernando. Uh, he is co-founder and CTO at Telexistence in Company and a senior assistant professor at KU University in Japan. He is a researcher in virtual reality and telexistence. Uh, Sharit, uh, you have the floor, please. Yes, we can hear you clearly. As everything is fine, we can see your presentation here.
What about five minutes is okay?
Okay, thank you, Sharit, for your presentation. Thank you for explaining us what is that existence and about some current issues on this field. I know that you must be very, very sleepy now because you are in the middle of your sleeping time, but if you, uh, if you may stay a little bit more with us, please stay with us for a question and answers session uh, in a few minutes. Thank you very much for the moment. Okay, thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Lorraine Porciuncula. She is an economist and policy analyst on communications, infrastructure, and services at the Digital Economy and Policy Division in the OECD. Lorraine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Wagner. Um, well, the previous presentations were very uh, were fascinating, very inspiring. Uh, they showed us. Uh, several applications, and um, I'll, I'll try to make my, my intervention uh, short. Uh, and I have, uh, I have five main points. Uh, today I'll focus on infrastructure and infrastructure issues. So while VR is growing in rapid rates uh, in terms of hardware and software and investment, uh, the world is still struggling to catch up in terms of infrastructure. So first I want to make the point about streaming. Uh, streaming is the mandate for content uh, um, online. Uh, today, everyone, uh, everyday consumers count with uh, streaming music, uh, movies, uh, series games, uh, sports events, or events like this one today here at the IGF. Uh, with VR, it will be no different. Uh, streaming is the new normal, uh, and, that's, and that's why uh, it matters for internet governance issues. Um, the second, uh, the expectation that content will be streamed has uh, important implications for the network. Uh, this is my second point, uh, bandwidth. Uh, for VR to work, uh, each VR stream needs to be duplicated, uh, one for each eye. So dual streams require uh, a lot of bandwidth. Um, estimates uh, from VR providers show that a 70, a 720p VR video stream now takes at least uh, a 50 megabits per second uh, connection. So just to give you an idea, the majority of OECD countries are much below uh, this threshold. Uh, in our estimates, um, only Korea, Sweden, and Japan have average broadband speed for gamers. Uh, they're abo above 50 megabits per second. Uh, in the US, the average speed for everyday users is around 14 megabits per second. For gamers, those are higher uh, because they care a lot about their bandwidth, uh, and the average speeds are 34 megabits per second, so not reaching 50 megabits at all. In Brazil, because our host here is Brazilian, gamers have an average a speed of nine megabits per second. Uh, so how will we enable VR uh, streaming with these current speeds? Um, You'd think that uh, countries are developing all sorts of ambitious connectivity targets, uh, but the reality is that they're very much behind. Uh, for the future, even if we continue uh, to improve techniques to compress videos, such as uh, performing spatial redundancy that's being done in VR, intelligent slicing, and tiling techniques and encoding techniques such as pyramid geometry, and it's something that Facebook's working on, uh, demands will continue to be even higher. Uh, for 4K VR video streaming, it's expected that we'll have, we'll need uh, 500 megabits uh, uh, connections. Uh, other estimates that foresee VR as a digital experience at the full fidelity of, uh, of human perception to recreate exactly every photon that our eyes would see, every small vibration that uh, our ears would hear, and eventually other details that we could touch uh, smell and temperature and that really calculating all that kind of uh, human perceptions, we would need to be able to process 5.2 gigabits per second of sound and light. That is so-called the tactile internet, or as the other speaker said, uh, the tele-existence. So just to give you an idea, the most ambitious connectivity target uh, among OECD countries is of one gigabit per second 
in Korea and Sweden. Sweden aims to have 98% of households and businesses uh, connected with one gigabit per second by 2025. And that is the highest within all OECD countries. The majority is aiming at universal connections of 30 megabits per second, uh, some at 50 megabits per second and others at 100. The FCC in the US predicted uh, that 25, 25 megabits per second would be the future requirements for broadband networks. So when we compare the, the prediction of 5 to point, the 5 to point gigabits per second with those predictions and those targets, we see that we're, uh, we're a long way behind and this is countries looking at the long term. So, uh, but this long term is not nearly enough for really advanced VR applications. And my third point is on latency. Uh, latency refers to the time delay, uh, normally measured in milliseconds between I initial input and output. So minimizing latency uh, is, uh, is of interest for uh, capital markets, for example, because they, uh, in, in areas such as algorithm trading, uh, online gaming, among others. Uh, VR requires also ultra low uh, latency. As several studies have shown, the latency in simulators need to be equal or smaller than the latency between our, outside, uh, our eyesight and other sensors in, a, uh, in our brain. Otherwise, it causes motion sickness. So VR, for VR and augmented reality applications, uh, uh, the delay between action to reaction is the threshold of uh, 15 me uh, milliseconds to seven milliseconds. That is very low latency. 5G is promising to bring latency uh, down to uh, 10 milliseconds. However, uh, we need to have backhaul with fiber in order to do that. And we are certainly not there yet, not in the new city countries, let alone developing countries. Uh, and then I come from my po uh, to my fourth uh, point and final, coverage. Uh, we are still very much behind in terms of uh, high-speed internet coverage. And uh, in the panel just before this one, we were, we were tackling the issue of rural broadband. Uh, we certainly do not have high-speed uh, uh, internet in, in rural areas. So the divide exists between urban and rural, rich and, rich and poor, young and old, male and female users. Um, the infrastructure is a crucial bottleneck for VR development and one that cannot be overlooked. So I just, I just wanted to make this, uh, this point of infrastructure, uh, streaming, bandwidth requirement, latency, and coverage. Thank you very much for Lorraine for being so objective and for your four concerns. Streaming, bandwidth, latency, and coverage. And especially latency that caused me already some sickness. Uh, <coughs> let's move for the next and the last speaker, uh, Ana Cristina de Azevedo. She is a professor at McKinsey University in Sao Paulo. She's a researcher in digital law and digital rights. You have the floor, please. First, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to contribute to this session. And I know I don't have much time, so I will also be very objective. And actually, I will start illustrating um, what is my privacy concern. I have this presentation, and in the middle of this presentation, I got a pop-up of the manufacturer of my notebook um, asking me to select an option, send the data to HP to check my warranty status. Oh. And because I'm in a rush, of course, I will just click OK. And my data is already shared. Uh, this is not the case. But um, what virtual reality changed if we compare with other privacy concerns uh, in smartphones, for instance? Well, um, I would say that um, most of us maybe that are here attending the IGF, have already uh, made a, a checkup, a privacy checkup at Google or Facebook, and maybe opted out um, of many, many um, sharing clauses that they offer us. Um, but 
unfortunately, most people, they don't do that. Uh, they don't have this patience. They don't have time to read everything and uh, they just click, uh, okay, okay, next, and that's it. Virtual reality, uh, these new applica applications, they innovate because besides storing so much data about uh, just information that we give them, virtual reality applications, they also store data about our movements and also about voice. I don't know how many people here had the chance to uh, try a Kinect, but if you have an Xbox at home with this Kinect device, it's basically recording everything that you say. Oh no, Microsoft says that they don't record. They are just, uh, they pay attention until the time you say turn on. But if you are not saying turn on, they are not uh, taking care of what you are doing. Um, also, they say, ah, the user always has the right to check or uncheck what, which kind of information he or she wants to share. So, uh, this would already be a great risk for us because, well, you never know the future. Maybe uh, your, mo your main privacy concern today regards your parents if you are a child or a teenager, or if you are married and you are cheating on someone, the, your main privacy concern will be regarding your wife or husband. Or if you are just, uh, just a citizen, um, yes, you might be concerned about the information these companies have about you. Or if you are a criminal, what about the government? What if Kinect has collected information, what happened there, and uh, maybe this information will be used against you in a criminal suit? So the, the concerns, they are different. Uh, they uh, regard different people, different actors. And um, it's not all about privacy. We should also concern about security because we see Today, many data breaches, they happen all the time. I do have a Yahoo account and uh, I remember they sent me an email, hey, I'm sorry, we got, um, unfortunately, a data breach happened and we are kindly requesting our users to change the password. Okay, but the password, oh, I have basically three or five passwords that I use for everything and now, I should not only change this password at my Yahoo account, but also everywhere I also use this password. And in the end, I didn't do anything, and some months later, oh, I didn't change the password at Yahoo, and I didn't even remember anymore which password was object of this data breach. What could we do? We, we as users, we cannot do much regarding security. We, I, I would say we can basically share um, not much, we, we should not share much. But Brazilians love Facebook and I see there are different profiles. There are many people that basically share every day what they eat, where they go, they share everything on Facebook. Others don't. Others will share um, more professional information, others will share um, moments of happiness and uh, let's not share too much. But what internet governance could do? Well, the, the Brazilian Marco Civil has a very nice rule just to exemplify that rules they could help. Um, according to our law, uh, application providers, all these websites and uh, devices that can interact with, uh, use the, the internet platform, they can only keep records from other applications upon the consent of the data owner. Why other applications? Because once you have um, the VR headsets, okay, you might have uh, completely agreed with all the terms of use of these VR headsets, but you will also need to agree with terms of use of other applications that you, where you will use your headsets. 
and uh, that's why this rule is important but it's not only the rule i would say that um we we need to to be patient users they need to be patient they need to be educated to realize how risky it is when you share information it might be great sometimes but uh, it also involves risks and uh, users must be aware of this thank you very much okay <coughs> thank you Ana Cristina for your uh, contribution and to make some alerts about the great risk uh, about new type of data is collected and maybe shared like voice movement sentiment reaction and now it's time to open the floor for the audience here so if you have any question please use the microphone raise your hand and use the microphone please Okay, one, two, first you, and then here. Okay, please uh, don't forget to identify yourself. Hello, my name is Gabriel Souto. I'm from Brazil also, and I'm part of U5 Jeff. Um, on a perspective of the companies that produces and commercialize VRs, uh, how they can uh, maintain the the use of the VR like uh, for the apps uh, using gel uh, reference and other voice voice and picking the data and uh, gu guarantee the the privacy of the users I mean it's a it's a tough uh, team but I think we also have to propose some solutions um, one I can I can propose is terms of service, but we we all know that is a contract that you don't really read. Uh, don't really check and read. So, uh, do you have some proposal for that solution or solution? Thank you. Uh, just a sec before <coughs> Anna Christina, if you one of the uh, remote speakers want to also to uh, reply this question please, please feel free okay first uh, Christina. well I guess in our uh, in our audience we don't have only lawyers so it's important to mention that sometimes a contract might have uh, an illegal clause and if this happens a judge will sentence that this clause is illegal and it has no value at all. But also another rule, another interesting rule from the Brazilian Marco Civil is that uh, application providers, they, uh, it's forbidden for them to keep personal data that is excessive in relation to the purpose for which consent was given by its data owner. But well, this does not solve all of our problems because probably this storage will happen. They will have this information. And unless the user uh, suits the company, nothing will happen. So still, we will always need that the user is educated for these kind of new devices, new technologies and virtual reality. It's uh, still, um, it's just getting more serious with this thing of recording motion and, um, yeah. So one of the remote speakers started saying something, right? Yeah. No? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Jogo, you want? Yeah. I, I just want to add a comment on this that I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I do a lot of researches regarding cognitive science and so on. And we are seeing a lot of movement re regarding like privacy and what, for example, the suppliers collect the data from us, etc. But now we are starting to see a new movement regarding my privacy of my sense, as I said before, because for me, it's very, very dangerous like providers or the the ex, exper, uh, experiences developers because they can influence you so we have seen before uh, many social medias doing 
psychologist experiment say oh, I'll get this group of people and I will just show hat things and I'll get this group of thing a uh, group of people and just show bad things and see how they would behave so we, we had this before but now in a virtual reality you are not just using a screen you are not just typing your phone no you are immersed in a digital world and I don't know if you have a right try, but it's incredible, it's amazing, and there are a lot of psychology impact on this. But for example, just to show uh, and to exemplify this, uh, there is a research that was performed, I can show the paper after, that's not my research, but uh, they get a group of people and two groups of people, and they, in a virtual reality, they build an island and the the audience when they put the smart the headset they want they needed to perform some tasks in this island but the case here is that they descend in that island in that digital island for one group was synchronized with our real sun the the time to to move the sun and for other group they move like three times faster and after they experience it, they ask the people, oh, how long have you been there? And they say, ah, oh, one hour, and so. And the other people that the faster move, the, the sun moved faster, it was like, ah, I spent there like two hours, three hours. So it changed our perception. And you be immersed in, in an environment that will be controlled, as I said, by big companies, as Facebook has already launched the Facebook Spaces. That's the Facebook exactly you use, but with uh, virtual reality. So we, we need to move a step forward because, of course, we need to say about data collection, but also about how they can interfere in our experience as humans. Well, uh, we have to finish because you may realize that the transcription ha has already finished before we finish the session. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, so you, we have to finish the session. Uh, so, I want to thank uh, to thanks uh, uh, everyone who uh, participate, who attended this meeting. Especially, I want to thanks the to the speakers, and also I want to thanks the remote speakers. Thank you very much for joining us, and um, I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much.